Hi, my name is Nacho. Welcome back to the channel. So, Rebel Moon happened. And I'll admit, I was one of the few that looked at the trailer and was excited for this to be Zack Snyder's big F.U. Yeah, to Catherine baby. Kennedy and literally shit all over the woke-ass latest installments of Disney Star Wars. But that's not at all what happened. The best way I can describe Rebel Moon is you picked up a nerd's library full of graphic novels and then threw it at someone's head and then asked them, did you get it? Oh, did you get it? Did you get it? Which is pretty much what Saki Boy did with this movie and later complained about when everyone stood up with a headache asking him why he did that. Because from the moment I hit play, I was hit with so much information, no! I got a concussion no! trying to make sense of it all. If you haven't watched it yet, Rebel Moon, The Child of Fire is a 12, one hour long episode TV season heavily condensed into a two hour movie with a three hour director's cut coming up that reminds me a lot of the first time I played Max Payne because every moment that has the slightest amount of action in it is packed with the most low mo I'm willing to assume that if you sped up some of those moments, this movie would easily be less than 90 minutes long. The one good thing I'll say about this movie is that it has the most amazing costumes and makeup design I've seen in a while. And that's it. I can't say anything else is good, because the story is confusing, the characters I don't care enough about, the CGI is good, until it isn't. There's so much happening all the time that the only way you can keep up is with heavy narration and we know that's never a good thing. Zack is not to have done this in a lot of his movies, 300 for example, but it worked better in that one because it felt like we were hearing a compelling story from someone we eventually got to know who was heavily involved in that story, one of the Spartans himself. Rebel Moon is not like that and this is heavy spoilers territory, but don't worry, it won't mess anything important to you. First off, the movie starts with interdimensional travel through a space vagina. And to all my male audience, it's up here. And from that moment, we get heavy narration about the state of the universe, the royal family getting assassinated, the new region going from world to world and conquering everything, until we get to Korra, the main boss girl of the story, farming. Now, the movie slows down for a bit, and we get to know some of the characters, some of the farmers, one out of the two Darion Harris is here, and he's pretty much a bitch, you get some time to breathe until the space Nazis arrive with the second Darwin Harris. He kills the village leader. Who could have seen that coming? Demand all the food from the harvest in about 10 weeks. They leave some asshole soldiers behind. And you can tell these guys are up to no good. It's very simple to determine that these guys are cunt just by listening to them. Some more water. Jack! What the hell is his problem? I don't know. And here's where my nerd brain started to malfunction when they introduced Jimmy. A robot from the Mechanicus Militarum. Not the Astra Militarum or the Adeptus Mechanicus, those come later, the Mechanicus Militarum. Basically sentient soldier machines that are somehow immune to direct fire until the plot needs them not to be, can process feelings and even blush, and were loyal to the Empire of the Slay King or whatever, and now they just follow orders from anyone. But you can definitely tell that Zack has been reading on some of those Warhammer novels. So when the cute girl from the village is about to get raped by the big muscular dudes, that's when our girl boss Cora decides to abandon her plans of leaving the village to save her. Now, the other good thing that they did with this movie is explore through some flashbacks the military upbringing of Cora and how she basically was made to be a child of war. That being said, I still find it super weird how this 60 kilogram girl, no matter how skilled she is, was able to take down a barn full of fully armed soldiers who don't shoot at her while she's killing them one by one and when they do shoot at her, her thick ass plot armor deflects all the bullets away from her body. This happens in every firefight she's in. After they slaughter the soldiers with the help of Jimmy who is now best friends with cute girl and random skinny guy A, I don't know his name, don't worry about it, we never see him again after that. Korra decides to go and gather soldiers to fight the Planet Destroyer Dreadnought class starship and its army that's coming for them in about 10 weeks. So for that, they have to go to the main city. Now, does she take the strongest hunter in the village, the manliest man full of semen, or the extremely deadly and now rebellious killing robot, or the crops manager? If you pick the latter, 
you are correct. From this point on, forget about Breathing Room, because they meet Charlie Hunnam's character in a gay bar after they survive yet another close quarters firefight unscathed, so he offers to fly them around. We start jumping from planet to planet meeting characters so quickly that you don't have time to process why are they even joining them, but don't worry, they'll tell you all about that later. So we go to one place and we meet Tarek the topless guy with the most chiseled abs you've ever seen in your life, who apparently can talk to animals, they free him from his labor, who immediately gets killed by a griffith. What an idiot, I felt nothing. And then we go to meet Nemesis, the token Asian lady who's good with swords, this is Katana, she's got my back, who fights the spider lady who kidnapped and plans to kill one of the resident's kids. Now in this fight, we are meant to feel bad for the spider lady who's out to kill a child because the fumes from the mining colony prevented her eggs from hatching and potentially killing more people. Nemesis doesn't want to kill the spider because she understands a mother's pain. Why does she? I don't know. It's not explained until later. But she proceeds to chop her to bits with her swords and halfway through the fight she decides to ignite them. And she does that little trick we all saw in the trailer that made everyone think that those were lightsabers. They are not. And my only thought throughout all of that was, why didn't she open with that? If you obviously can't negotiate with the monster, throw your best shit at her before it kills you. Anyways, the spider dies, I feel nothing, and now Nemesis is on the team. Next up, we go to another planet to recruit the former genius general, now down on his luck, Titus, played by Jimon Hansu. who throws a bit of a tantrum, doesn't want to join, but then does after Korra calls him a little bitch. Finally, we meet the Bloodaxe twins and their gender-fluid militia and Darian Bloodaxe joins their cause. Now, I thought he was the best character. Really well played, looked cool, total badass leader. He dies. Yeah. Not even in a cool way. He misses a guy with his spear and gets shot point blank. I still feel nothing. Now, there's a lot that happens in the middle that I don't feel it's worth the time telling you, so I'll just jump to the end where they get betrayed by Kai, Charlie Hunnam, Space Dario gets to them, and we get told in very blatant exposition who each one of them is. Commander Bloodax, leader of the very insurgency, the King's gaze was sent to this backwater of the galaxy to capture. He's no introduction, does he? His actions at the Battle of Sarah will precede him. Nemesis lost her children and proceeded to slaughter high-ranking officers of the Mother World, a mother's pain. Now it makes sense. Tarak is actually Prince Tarak. Which world is he Prince of? I have no idea. Doesn't matter, look at his abs. And Korra, or Artemisia, who fucking cares, boss girl, is the lost adopted daughter of the current gone happy region and she must be returned to him alive. Crops manager Dario sets them free after killing Charlie. We get in a huge firefight where all non-important characters get killed rather quickly. Bloodax dies in the most dumb way imaginable. Non-binary militia soldier lets go of an ugly scream. Korra beats the absolute living shit out of a space Dario and they bring down an imperial gunship or similar. Which is actually very important and should be seen as a great victory for the resistance and the beginning of the change. And how do I know this, you might ask? Because they literally tell you it is. This small act of defiance gives voice to the voiceless. This is more than just a boring prick officer and some of his men. It's the beginning of something. Thank you, mm. Captain Obvious. They go back to the farming village. We get the weirdest line of dialogue from Tarak, where he basically says, it's a beautiful place to die in. You've won. For now. You still have to fight the rest of the Imperial forces. Don't worry. You're a male character in a modern day sci-fi action thriller. You might still just get the axe, no matter how good your abs look. There's a lot of ways to say this place is nice without necessarily going, oh, I would really like to die in here. Oh look, there's Jimmy, the dumbass useless robot. In the final bit of the film, we find that Space Dario is actually alive and half cyborg, apparently, and a couple of non-tech priests from the non-Adeptus Mechanicus patch him to the network so he can get an audience with the region and later Frankenstein him back to life. The end. So that's pretty much all that happens in Rebel Moon. Oh, and the daughter of the slain king apparently can bring things back to life, but I didn't understand why that was relevant or if she's even alive. And that's the problem. There's so much happening in this, so much lore that I would have liked to know before we got to the main battle, 
and is compressed into the story so hard that it ends up feeling like nothing makes sense. I don't feel like seeing the 3 hour cut of this, because how important can the extra stuff be if it didn't make it to the first release? Either way, I didn't have time to care for any of the characters. They got shoved in my face so quickly I nearly choked. And an extra hour of this is not gonna make me give any more of a shit. This honestly felt like the plot of a fully fledged miniseries that people deny Zack the funding unless he made it into a movie. And he ran out of time to put everything he wanted in there. A very big case to make where sometimes less is more. But the biggest sin this movie commits is that in its two hour runtime, we get constant gratuity shots of Tarek's abs. We get a bar full of tranny prostitutes, space game molesters, a figurative space pussy portal, and not a single space titty. 4 out of 10. But if you watched this far into the video, leave us a like. Check out this video next. Let me know in the comments down below what are your plans for New Year's. Hope everyone had a very Merry Christmas. And as always, I've been at your hope you enjoyed the video. And I'll see you in the next one. Take care.